Welcome to the Dr. Izzy's Medical Podcast Channel. Diabetes insipidus is a condition characterized by large amounts of dilute urine and increased thirst. The amount of urine produced can be nearly 20 liters per day. Reduction of fluid has little effect on the concentration of the urine. Complications may include dehydration or seizures. There are four types of diabetes insipidus, each with a different set of causes. Central diabetes insipidus is due to a lack of the hormone vasopressin. This can be due to injury to the hypothalamus or pituitary gland or genetics. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus occurs when the kidneys do not respond properly to vasopressin. Dipsogenic diabetes insipidus is a result of excessive fluid intake due to damage to the hypothalamic thirst mechanism. It occurs more often in those with certain psychiatric disorders or on certain medications. Gestational diabetes insipidus occurs only during pregnancy. Diagnosis is often based on urine tests, blood tests, and the fluid deprivation test. Diabetes insipidus is unrelated to diabetes mellitus and the conditions have a distinct mechanism, though both can result in the production of large amounts of urine. Treatment involves drinking sufficient fluids to prevent dehydration. Other treatments depend on the type. In central and gestational diabetes insipidus, treatment is with desmopressin. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus may be treated by addressing the underlying cause or the use of a thiazide, aspirin or ibuprofen. The number of new cases of diabetes insipidus each year is 3 in 100,000. Central DI usually starts between the ages of 10 and 20 and occurs in males and females equally. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus can begin at any age. Signs and symptoms. Excessive urination and extreme thirst and increased fluid intake are typical for diabetes insipidus. The symptoms of excessive urination and extreme thirst are similar to what is seen in untreated diabetes mellitus, with the distinction that the urine does not contain glucose. Blurred vision is a rarity. Signs of dehydration may also appear in some individuals, since the body cannot conserve much of the water it takes in. Extreme urination continues throughout the day and the night. In children, diabetes insipidus can interfere with appetite, eating, weight gain and growth, as well. They may present with fever, vomiting or diarrhea. Adults with untreated diabetes insipidus may remain healthy for decades as long as enough water is consumed to offset the urinary losses. However, there is a continuous risk of dehydration and loss of potassium that may lead to hypokalemia. Causes, the several forms of diabetes insipidus are. 1. Central causes. Central diabetes insipidus has many possible causes. According to the literature, the principal causes of central diabetes insipidus and their off-sited approximate frequencies are as follows. Idiopathic, malignant or benign tumors of the brain or pituitary, cranial surgery, head trauma, nephrogenic. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is due to the inability of the kidney to respond normally to vasopressin. 2. Dipsogenic causes. Dipsogenic diabetes insipidus or primary polydipsia results from excessive intake of fluids as opposed to deficiency of arginine vasopressin. It may be due to a defect or damage to the thirst mechanism, located in the hypothalamus, or due to mental illness. Treatment with desmopressin may lead to water intoxication. Gestational causes. Gestational diabetes insipidus occurs only during pregnancy in the postpartum period. During pregnancy, women produce vasopressinase in the placenta, which breaks down antidiuretic hormone. Gestational diabetes insipidus is thought to occur with excessive production and or impaired clearance of vasopressinase. Most cases of gestational diabetes insipidus can be treated with desmopressin, but not vasopressin. In rare cases, however, an abnormality in the thirst mechanism causes gestational diabetes insipidus, and desmopressin should not be used. Diabetes insipidus is also associated with some serious diseases of pregnancy, including preeclampsia, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelet syndrome and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. These cause diabetes insipidus by impairing hepatic clearance of circulating vasopressinase. It is important to consider these diseases if a woman presents with diabetes insipidus in pregnancy, because their treatments require delivery of the baby before the disease will improve. Failure to treat these diseases promptly can lead to maternal or perinatal mortality. Diagnosis To distinguish diabetes insipidus from other causes of excess urination, blood glucose levels, bicarbonate levels, and calcium levels need to be tested. Measurement of blood electrolytes can reveal a high sodium level. Urinalysis demonstrates a dilute urine with a low specific gravity. Urine osmolarity and electrolyte levels are typically low. 
A fluid deprivation test is another way of distinguishing diabetes insipidus from other causes of excessive urination. If there is no change in fluid loss, giving desmopressin can determine if diabetes insipidus is caused by 1. A defect in antidiuretic hormone production. 2. A defect in the kidney's response to antidiuretic hormone. This test measures the changes in body weight, urine output, and urine composition when fluids are withheld to induce dehydration. The body's normal response to dehydration is to conserve water by concentrating the urine. Those with diabetes insipidus continue to urinate large amounts of dilute urine in spite of water deprivation. In primary polydipsia, the urine osmolality should increase and stabilize at above 280 milliosmoles per kilogram of water with fluid restriction, while a stabilization at a lower level indicates diabetes insipidus. Stabilization in this test means, more specifically, when the increase in urine osmolality is less than 30 osmoles per kilogram per hour for at least 3 hours. Sometimes measuring blood levels of antidiuretic hormone toward the end of this test is also necessary, but is more time-consuming to perform. To distinguish between the main forms, desmopressin stimulation is also used. Desmopressin can be taken by injection, a nasal spray, or a tablet. While taking desmopressin, a person should drink fluids or water only when thirsty and not at other times, as this can lead to sudden fluid accumulation in the central nervous system. If desmopressin reduces urine output and increases urine osmolarity, the hypothalamic production of antidiuretic hormone is deficient, and the kidney responds normally to exogenous vasopressin. If the diabetes insipidus is due to kidney pathology, desmopressin does not change either urine output or osmolarity. Whilst diabetes insipidus usually occurs with polydipsia, it can also rarely occur not only in the absence of polydipsia but in the presence of its opposite, adipsia. Adipsic diabetes insipidus is recognized as a marked absence of thirst even in response to hyperosmolality. In some cases of adipsic diabetes insipidus, the person may also fail to respond to desmopressin. If central diabetes insipidus is suspected, testing of other hormones of the pituitary, as well as magnetic resonance imaging, particularly a pituitary MRI, is necessary to discover if a disease process is affecting pituitary function. Most people with this form have either experienced past head trauma or have stopped antidiuretic hormone production for an unknown reason. Habit drinking is the most common imitator of diabetes insipidus at all ages. While many adult cases in the medical literature are associated with mental disorders, most people with habit polydipsia have no other detectable disease. The distinction is made during the water deprivation test, as some degree of urinary concentration above isosmolar is usually obtained before the person becomes dehydrated. Treatment Treatment involves drinking sufficient fluids to prevent dehydration. Other treatments depend on the type. In central and gestational diabetes insipidus treatment is with desmopressin. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus may be treated by addressing the underlying cause or the use of a thiazide, aspirin, or ibuprofen. 1. Central Central diabetes insipidus and gestational diabetes insipidus respond to desmopressin which is given as intranasal or oral tablets. Carbamazepine, an anticonvulsive medication, has also had some success in this type of diabetes insipidus. Also, gestational diabetes insipidus tends to abate on its own 4-6 to six weeks following labor though some women may develop it again in subsequent pregnancies. In dipsogenic diabetes insipidus, desmopressin is not usually an option. 2. Nephrogenic. Desmopressin will be ineffective in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus which is treated by reversing the underlying cause and replacing the free water deficit. A thiazide diuretic, such as chlorothaladone or hydrochlorothiazide, can be used to create mild hypovolemia which encourages salt and water uptake in proximal tubule and thus improved nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Amylaride has additional benefit of blocking NA uptake. Thiazide diuretics are sometimes combined with amylaride to prevent hypokalemia caused by the thiazide. It seems paradoxical to treat an extreme diuresis with a diuretic, and the exact mechanism of action is unknown but the thiazide diuretics will decrease distal convoluted tubule reabsorption of sodium and water thereby causing diuresis. This decreases plasma volume, thus lowering the glomerular filtration rate and enhancing the absorption of sodium and water in the proximal nephron. Less fluid reaches the distal nephron, so overall fluid conservation is obtained. Lithium-induced nephrogenic diabetes insipidus may be effectively managed with the administration of amylaride, a potassium-sparing diuretic often used in conjunction with thiazide or loop diuretics. Clinicians have been aware of lithium toxicity for many years, and traditionally have administered thiazide diuretics for lithium-induced polyuria and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. 
However, a Millerite has recently been shown to be a successful treatment for this condition. Thank you for listening Dr. Izzy's medical podcast series. If you want to support this project please subscribe the channel and like this video. Thank you.